Greetings, parents, students, teachers, and community members of Southmoreland School District. Allow me to greet any of our students who may be watching with a virtual fist bump on behalf of our administrators and teachers. Make it a great day, girls and boys. My name is Mr. Ronald Haichu, and I serve as the school psychologist and director of student services for the Southmoreland School District. I also serve as the chairperson for the Communication and Community Outreach Task Force for our school reopening plan. On behalf of the Southmoreland School District Administration, the Southmoreland School District Board of Directors, and the Southmoreland School District teachers, we would like to welcome you and thank you for your questions, your thoughts, your concerns, and your input as we chart our course for return to school for the 2020-2021 school year. We are most grateful for your time and your support of our school district, our students, and our teachers. Your genuine and sincere concern and compassion for our students and teachers is most evident in the nature of your submissions and questions presented through the avenue of the dedicated community relations email account we established for the purpose of hearing directly from you beyond your responses to the surveys we have previously solicited. We would also like to say thank you to the countless numbers of you who have offered your appreciation and support of and your prayers for our administrative team as we navigate these difficult circumstances and the trying decisions our current reality dictates. The information we are providing you today is consistent with the most recent guidance issued by the Pennsylvania Department of Health and the Pennsylvania Department of Education and is subject to revision in accordance with any potential updated guidance forthcoming. This statement was released by our state governmental agencies just last week. Secretary Rivera, Secretary Levine, and the Pennsylvania Department of Education identified the hybrid approach as the best approach to the reopening of schools because from a public health perspective, it practices social distancing and is coupled with in-person instruction which is the most effective form of instruction. Because this is a novel pandemic and everyone continues to learn more about COVID-19 each day, the Commonwealth has to take into consideration the best practices from both a public health and public education perspective. And as school districts start to plan for the school year, a hybrid approach is a good model that engages each community. To begin, and as a matter of reference for you, we received over 120 emails from you since we made the request and offering on Tuesday, July 14th, with the window for question and comment submission closing on Sunday, July 19th at five o'clock p.m. We would like to assure you that every one of your emails was read and that our administrative team was forwarded for their review, those specific questions and comments associated with the task force of which he or she is associated. Today's presentation will address the majority of and the most frequently recurring of those questions and concerns posed. We will open our conversation today with our answers and responses to those questions and comments that are most general in nature. We will then address those most frequently recurring questions that are more specific to our operational task force areas, those being facilities, logistics and transportation, instruction and student services, health and safety, and staffing and resources. Many of you have asked if teachers have been involved in the development of our return to school plan. They have. 
Our teachers have had the opportunity from the onset of this endeavor to participate in any of our five school reopening task forces, and they have selflessly embraced that invitation and are actively involved. The invitation to join any of the task forces remains open to their voluntary contributions. Many of you also asked if we could share our survey results and why the option for a full return was not provided as an option for our school district students, as is being offered by some school districts in our county. With respect to the full five-day return to school for all students, our school district administrative team and board of directors agreed that we would not be able to open schools as normal as other school districts are proposing and be in compliance with the guidelines put forth by the Federal Center for Disease Control and Pennsylvania Department of Health and Pennsylvania Department of Education to maintain our students and staff safely. We do not believe that it is an honest representation to say that we are going to open school as normal and keep students and staff safe or execute guidelines to the greatest extent possible, knowing full well that there is no way to arrange students' desks to position students six feet apart during instruction with all students in attendance. As for the survey results, we proposed four separate reopening schedules. Of those four models, the AB model that was ultimately board approved received 32% endorsement by the 1,179 respondents. The other models received the following percentages, 33%, 31%, and 4%. Accordingly, there was not a model schedule proposed that received disproportionately more support among the respondents. Given these findings, the school district will proceed with the AB model for school reopening, which we believe to be in the best interest of students and staff safety and provides the greatest educational, instructional, and social emotional benefits for all. Furthermore, the AB model places our school district in the best position to be fluid and to be able to pivot in accordance with any state order that would either loosen or tighten restrictions related to the current circumstances associated with this pandemic. Our school district administrative team and task forces would also like to update the community with respect to phase one of our school reopening plan. As we indicated in our initial community task force meeting series, we identified the following action items. Number one, complete the Pennsylvania Department of Education phased school reopening health and safety plan. This plan has been completed and was approved by the Southmoreland School Board of Directors on June 25th, 2020. This plan continues to be updated and submitted to the state as needed. Number two, identify the chosen blended learning model. The chosen blended learning model is the AB schedule, which will be addressed and explained more thoroughly to you in this presentation. Number three, modify the school calendar to accommodate teacher professional learning. The school calendar has been modified to maximize teacher training and capacity building at the beginning of the school year, and this too has been approved by our school board. Number four, complete staff, student, and for, uh, pardon me, family surveys. Our administrative team has authored and issued surveys regarding return to school, as well as proposed reopening models, 
and has additionally established a dedicated community relations email account to receive parent, teacher, and student questions and concerns. Number five, family household counts. Family household counts were determined through our school district student information management system based on student address. Number six, establish attendance policies for students and staff. Additional guidance regarding attendance policy for school staff will be forthcoming from PDE. Student attendance will continue to be tracked and monitored with appropriate judgment and discretion considering our ever evolving circumstances. Moving forward beyond today's presentation, we will next embark on those action items associated with phase two of the school reopening plan. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the hard work and dedication that our building level principals and our special education coordinator have devoted to our back to school plan and the presentation you are about to view. These folks have dedicated countless hours of consultation with peers within and beyond our school district to develop and refine ideas that they will be sharing today in the form of various visuals for your reference, including fact sheets, flow charts, and frequently asked questions documents. Additionally, a color-coded school calendar is now available, clearly indicating the designated A days and B days of the school schedule so that families will be able to plan accordingly upon learning the day assigned to their household for students' attendance at brick and mortar buildings. Before we hear from our building principals and our special education coordinator, allow me a moment to respond to a specific challenge presented in an email we received. One parent implored our administrative team to convince her family to choose Southmoreland School District's AB schedule over alternatives that are available to our families. Other emailers echoed similar sentiments. Our team readily accepts and embraces this challenge. When deciding between your community's home, Southmoreland School District, and the alternatives that are available to you, in our opinion, there is no comparison worthy of consideration and for one reason, our Southmoreland School District teachers. Over my four years of employment with the Southmoreland School District, I've had the unique experience in working in various capacities that have afforded me the opportunity, the privilege, and the honor of working both individually and with groups of teachers at each of our district's four school buildings, kindergarten through 12th grade. Prior to gaining employment with Southmoreland School District, I worked for the Westmoreland Intermediate Unit in service to a number of school districts across Westmoreland County. In all of my previous 23 years of employment and education outside of Southmoreland, I have never come in contact with teachers of the caliber, the dedication, the ingenuity, the creativity, the brilliance, and the compassion as that demonstrated by our Southmoreland School District teachers. Our teachers provide that it factor that is not available to your children, our students, through any of those alternatives that may seem so appealing on the surface. Our teachers are about to embark on a capacity building journey that will subsequently support their ability to build the capacity of your children, our students. Are these difficult and trying times? No doubt they are. Is there great and continued uncertainty? Absolutely, there is. However, your children, our students will navigate these times and succeed beyond our wildest dreams because of their grit, their optimism, and their resilience. 
coupled with the bonds and relationships, they will continue to develop and expand alongside our dedicated and inspirational teachers. These relationships are as valuable, if not more valuable, than the educational content and skills that your children, our students, will acquire. I've heard many reference the idea that children don't remember specifics and content that they learned in school, but remember how their teachers made them feel. And these bonds and relationships go beyond our teachers. The human aspect, the human element of coming to school could not be more important than it is now in these times. Our students establish connections not only with our teachers, but with our administrators, with our paraprofessionals, with our custodial staff, with our related service providers, with our school nurses and our school counselors, with our cafeteria workers, and with our secretarial staff. Please do not ever discount or underestimate the life skills that your children, our students, acquire in these interactions with all of our support staff who are here for them. Thank you. At this time, I now turn over the presentation to our building level principals and our director of special education for their presentation of our responses to your specific questions related to the respective task force areas. We will proceed with Mrs. Tracy Kuhar Long, Southmoreland Middle School Principal and the chairperson of our Facilities, Logistics and Transportation Task Force. Mrs. Kuhar Long. Thank you, Mr. Haichu. As Mr. Haichu said, I am Mrs. Long, uh, middle school principal and chairperson for the Buildings, Logistics, and Transportation Task Force. I'm going to share a screen. Uh, Mr. Pushkar, I'm unable to share my screen. Members of the Facilities, Logistics, and Transportation Task Force, include Laura Geyer and Charlie Swink, both from the Transportation Department, Lee Mizwa, the Physical Plant Manager, Vicki Capone and Kelly Smitley from the Food Service Department, and Larry Ansel and Stacey Weaver, both teachers within our district. In developing these plans, we considered the safety and health of all students, in addition to staff, as well as balancing the educational imperative to open schools to in-person instruction with the public health imperative to mitigate COVID-19 infection and transmission rates. We will continually monitor the prevalence and spread of COVID-19 in our community and be prepared to implement stronger containment or mitigation strategies. Mitigation efforts are important in terms of how they impact the spread of COVID-19, and this influences our schools. Regardless of one's beliefs, actions in our community will directly impact students returning to schools. I read every email that was shared with us and the scope of my presentation encompasses answers to questions regarding the physical distancing, face coverings, cleaning and disinfection, cafeteria service and busing, as well as a few others. How do we keep schools safe when reopening? To stay safe, there are a number of steps students, parents, teachers, administrators, and visitors must take to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Parents and guardians are encouraged to review and support these guidelines with your children. What is physical distancing? Social distancing or physical distancing means keeping a safe space between yourself and other people who are not members of your household. A distance of at least six feet apart without a face covering will help prevent the spread of the virus that causes COVID-19. The AB model allows for greater implementation of social distancing as only half the students will attend school on any given day, limiting the number of individuals in classrooms and other learning spaces, cafeterias, common areas, transportation, and interactions between groups of students. The AB model reduces the number of students attending each day and permits us to space desks in the classroom 
So the students will not need to wear face coverings as long as they are practicing social distancing guidelines of six feet apart. When possible, outdoor spaces will be utilized for instruction and activities in small groups. This is fundamental to lowering the risk of the spread of COVID-19 as the primary mode of transmission is through respiratory droplets by persons in close proximity. Visitors to the district are limited to the foyer area of each school building unless they are deemed essential to the functions of that specific building. What are face coverings? On July 16, 2020, the Secretary of Health issued an order requiring all individuals to wear a face covering when they leave their homes. The masking orders also apply to schools. This order applies to any individual age two or older. This order will remain in effect until the Secretary of Health determines the public health risk is sufficiently reduced so that face coverings are no longer necessary as a widely utilized public health tool. All students and non-students are required to wear face coverings inside, outside of all school buildings, on school district property, and outside when physical distancing of at least six feet is not possible. Anyone two years and older are required to wear a face covering unless they have a medical or mental health condition or disability documented in accordance with section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act or IDEA that precludes the wearing of a face covering in school. A face covering means a covering of the nose and mouth that is secured to the head with ties, straps or loops over the ears or is wrapped around the lower face. A face covering can be made from a variety of synthetic or natural fabrics, including cotton, silk, linen. For the purposes of this order, they can include a plastic face shield as well that covers the nose and mouth. Face coverings may be factory made, sewn by hand, or improvised from household items, including but not limited to scarves, bandanas, t-shirts, sweatshirts, or towels. Face coverings must be worn when unable to maintain a safe distance of six feet apart from others, such as in common areas and school buses, hallways, and stairwells. While we do have an adequate supply of surgical masks on hand for students and visitors who may forget theirs, your child must wear a face covering. Students cannot board the bus without a face covering. The driver will have a limited supply on hand. Transparent face coverings are recommended and provide the opportunity for more visual cues and should be considered as an alternative for younger students, students who are deaf and hard of hearing and their teachers. Students may remove face coverings when students are eating or drinking, when spaced at least six feet apart, seated at desks or assigned workspaces at least six feet apart, or engaged in an activity with at least six feet apart. Face coverings are mandatory per the order of the Secretary of the Health. Class changes in common areas. Students in grades two through five, excuse me, will remain with the same cohort of students throughout the day. Teachers will travel to their classrooms. Grades six through 12 will transition to their assigned classrooms as scheduled. Face coverings must be worn in common areas, such as hallways and stairwells. Hallways and stairwells will be labeled with one-way signage to cut down on crowding. Signage will also be posted throughout each building, reminding students and staff of the recommended guidelines. Hand hygiene, cleaning, and disinfection. COVID-19 may survive in certain surfaces for some time which means it is possible to be infected after touching a contaminated surface and then touching the mouth, eyes, or nose. Frequent hand washing along with cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, and ventilating learning spaces and any other areas which are used by students is recommended to reduce transmission. Hand hygiene. When hand washing, individuals should use soap and water to wash all surfaces of their hands for at least 20 seconds or sing happy birthday song at least twice. Wait for a visible lather, rinse thoroughly, and dry with a disposable towel. Use of hand sanitizer is also recommended. Please practice this at home with your child. Cleaning and disinfection. 
Cleaning and disinfecting will occur frequently throughout the school day on high touch surfaces and objects within the school and on school buses at least daily, including door handles, sink handles, and drinking fountains. Daily cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing of each building will occur throughout the day and evenings, with deep cleaning occurring after school hours. Additional custodial staff will be on duty from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. to assist in this process. High contact areas will be disinfected and sanitized between bus runs, and I will go into more detail uh, on the slide that deals with transportation. Frequent cleaning and disinfecting of bathrooms will occur frequently throughout the school day as well. The use of shared equipment is not recommended at this time. Water filling stations have been ordered and it is recommended that you send a water bottle to school with your child. Classroom doors will be locked yet propped open to reduce the touching of high touch surface areas such as door handles. We are using an order disinfectants registered by the EPA as effective against SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Increasing circulation of outdoor play by opening windows and doors when possible is also recommended. Deep cleaning and disinfection, again, of surfaces will occur after school hours. Only disinfectant products labeled as safe for humans and the environment and registered by the EPA as effective against the virus that causes COVID-19 will be used. Leaving classroom doors open while locked and windows will help reduce the transmission of the virus that causes COVID-19 and limit contact with high touch surfaces such as doorknobs. Health and safety plan. On June 25th, the school board approved the health and safety plan that was developed to ensure ongoing communication with families around the elements of the local health and safety plan of our district. This plan will be posted on the school district website. Communication awareness is a component of this plan. Signs will be posted in highly visible areas that promote everyday protective measures and describe how to stop the spread of the germs. Signs will be posted on how to stop the spread of COVID-19, such as screening symptoms and staying at home when sick, washing hands and everyday protective measures. Messages about behaviors that prevent the spread of COVID-19 will be shared when communicating with staff, teachers, families, and students via email, the um, district website, and also the robocall feature. The local health and safety plan, again, will be posted on the school district's website prior to allowing students to return to school. Regular updates will be posted on school websites and in parent flyers and letters. We encourage caregivers and families to practice and reinforce good prevention habits at home within your families. Remind your children to catch their cough or sneeze. This is one thing we should be teaching children not to share. We are urging parents and guardians and caregiver, excuse me, caregivers to keep children at home when they are sick or ill. We discourage students and families from gathering in public areas while school is dismissed to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in the community. A robocall will be placed to all households listed in our CSIEU management system to alert you to such information when it is posted on our school district website. We are urging families to support us in positioning our district to safely resume in-person instruction as soon as possible on a full-time basis. Regardless of one's beliefs, actions in our community will directly impact students returning to school. Given that children and adolescents may experience challenges in effectively adhering to these guidelines, it is critical that parents and staff set a good example for students by modeling behaviors around physical distancing, face coverings, and hand hygiene. When these precautions are taken seriously, disease transmission is likely to decrease. Staying home when sick is one of the most effective ways to minimize the risk of the transmission of COVID-19. Both symptom screening and testing are strategies used to identify individuals with COVID-19. We are urging parents to check your child's temperature prior to sending them to school. We will also utilize a school entry temperature screener. Any student or staff with a fever of 100.4 degrees or higher or possesses symptoms of possible COVID-19 infection should not be in school. 
Notify school officials if your child becomes sick and is not in attendance. Keeping children at home when they are ill is one of the critical issues in mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Next up is I'm Mr. Daniel. Yet, Mr. Haichu. Oh, you're not done? No. My apology. I just couldn't get the screen to load. The favorite times of the school day. This is uh, probably the favorite of our students. Um, these are times during the day when they get to socialize and engage in activities that are meaningful to them with less free adult control. Meals and cafeteria. Breakfast and lunches will be served in the cafeteria with students sitting at least six feet apart and wearing face coverings when they're walking to and from the cafeteria as well as when they're in line getting their food. Students will be seated in staggered arrangements to avoid across the table seating. Individual bag breakfast and lunches will be served. If students are bringing lunch to school, it must be in a disposable bag. Students are to report to the cafeteria in the morning only if they're eating breakfast. All other students are to report to either their designated area, homeroom, or first period class. Face coverings may be removed to eat or drink. However, at those times, social distancing must be practiced. A designated locked drop box will be available in each school for students paying by check or cash for lunch and breakfast. Place your check or cash in the envelope with your child's name and student ID number on the envelope. MySchoolBox.com is also another option for secure lunch payments. Be aware though, there is a small transaction fee. Regarding school meals on distance learning days, we are awaiting further guidance from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Pennsylvania Department of Agri or, excuse me, Pennsylvania Department of Education. More information will follow. Recess. Recess will be offered to students outdoors when possible. Students will not be able to use playground equipment, unfortunately, due to our inability to disinfect as necessary. Students will follow social distancing guidelines. Teachers will have planned activities such as jump rope, hula hoops, jumping, running activities, sidewalk chalk, etc. Students are not to bring personal items from home. Physical education. Grades K and 1 will be held in their classrooms. Grades 2 through 12 will be structured, non-contact activities in the gym or classroom. Students will not be permitted to change clothes. Oops, not done yet, sorry. I'm having computer issues, I apologize. Additional items and questions that were posed regarding meetings and field trips. Meetings are to be scheduled virtually. No field trips are planned at this time. School supplies. We will not be using lockers or cubbies this year until restrictions are released. Students are to carry all items with them throughout the day in a drawstring bag. This bag can hold items such as lunches, water bottles, hand sanitizer, disinfectant wipes, papers, pencils, etc. Students in grades K through five will have an assigned desk in the classroom to store personal items. Students on A day will have an assigned desk, so students on B day will not be sitting there, so they can store their uh, personal property in their desk. Attendance. The Pennsylvania Department of Education states that truancy is any unexcused absence from school. Monitoring student attendance during COVID-19 may present attendance challenges for students and schools. We will provide leniency and absenteeism from in-person instruction only when parents and guardians provide timely communication on the day of the absence. Discipline. Students are required to wear face coverings and follow social distancing guidelines. Discipline issues will be handled with common sense and good judgment but students who are willfully non-compliant will be addressed accordingly. PSSAs and keystone testing. 
This is not a district-wide decision. This decision is made by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Guidelines, recommendations, and orders concerning the closing of schools. The Department of Health will continue to monitor community transmission rates and other surveillance metrics across the Commonwealth, including pre-K to 12 school specific outbreaks of COVID-19. Based on this disease monitoring and surveillance, the Department of Health may, in close coordination with the Pennsylvania Department of Education, issue guidance related to targeted school closures as part of a wider public health mitigation strategy. The science and public health conditions surrounding COVID-19 are continually evolving. This guidance will be updated as new information becomes available. Busing and transportation. To the greatest extent possible, there will be only one student per bus seat. Family units may choose to sit together. Students who have other means of getting to school are encouraged to utilize those options. Opening of windows when feasible will help mitigate the spread of the virus. Driving passes are available at the high school main office. Face coverings are required by all riders on a school bus. Students will not be permitted to board the bus without a face covering. Again, bus drivers will have some on hand, but we recommend that parents send it to school with their child. They have to wear a face covering to board the school bus. Cleaning and disinfection of school buses. They will be deep cleaned and sanitized twice daily after morning drop off and afternoon pickup runs are complete. High contact surface areas will be disinfected between each bus run. Assigned seats. Students must remain in the same seat for the entire bus ride. If necessary, seats will be assigned. Students will board the bus from back to front and exit the bus from front to back. One of the most important um, questions we've been receiving is also about the AB schedule. Um, in regards to transportation, no bus passes will be issued and there will be no exceptions to that rule either. Please remember that transportation is a privilege and not a right. The AB transportation bus schedule. Requests can be made through Friday, July 24th of this week by 3 p.m. to Laura Geyer. Laura is at the high school. She is in the transportation department. All requests specific to whether you want your child attending on an A day or a B day related to employment or child care purposes must be in writing. No phone requests will be accepted. You can email, you can send a letter, you can fax if you need to stop at the high school. Um, one of the secretaries can meet with you and you can write it on a piece of paper. All requests must be in writing. Again, the request will be accepted through this Friday at 3 p.m. Upon conclusion of all requests, we will post the AB bus schedule by Wednesday of next week. Please be informed that if you have had an address or phone number change since this school year, you need to update that information immediately as we are using the information that we currently have on hand to draft the bus schedules. The final AB transportation schedule will be posted on the school website on Wednesday listed by child ID number. No student names will be listed. It will be by the child's school ID number. We will do our best to honor all requests. However, you need to be advised that we may not be able to honor every request, specifically if the AB schedule becomes imbalanced. Priority will be given to requests for employment and child care purposes. This is a calendar of what an AB cycle will look like. The yellow are A school days, the B are green school days, the blue days are simply days when students are not in session, whether that's an in-service day, an Act 80 day, a holiday, or whatnot. As you can see, it is a continuous cycle. All of these documents will be posted on the school district website. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Kuhar-Long. 
Next up at this time is Mr. Daniel Clara, Southmoreland Primary Center and Southmoreland Elementary School Principal and the Chairperson of our Health and Safety Task Force. Mr. Clara. Unmute, Mr. Clara. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that this message finds you well, enjoying some summer weather. Uh, I am on the Committee for Health and Safety and I would like to begin by talking about the scope of the work of our task force. The uh, Health and Safety Task Force includes the reviewing and updating of our health and safety plan that is required by PDE. Within that plan, our committee, which includes uh, members of the community, healthcare professionals, child care uh, providers, teachers, guidance counselors, nurses, and school board members. Uh, within that plan, we've worked to identify some of our district uh, and school level issues and plan to respond to them in time. These are just some of the things that the committee is currently working on. Protocols for contacting families of one sibling uh, or who has siblings is symptomatic. Procedures for suspected and confirmed cases for individuals and others impacted. Needs for nurses and counselors with respect to health and safety. Family and faculty traveling to governor hotspots areas and other expectations for quarantine. Attendance concerns for the 2020-2021 school year. Quarterly updates of family contact information to ensure communication, face coverings, backpacks and lunch bags, as Mrs. Long had uh, mentioned earlier, and comparisons of recommendations from the CDC, DOH, Department of Health, and the governor. Our task force again includes our teachers, nurses, counselors, board members, child care providers, safety professionals, health care professionals, and administrator. This work is challenging and that the guidance that we receive is often in conflict with one or more of the aforementioned organizations. So let's begin with the known symptoms for COVID-19. Uh, if a student or a faculty member is exhibiting one of the following symptoms, CDC recommends staying home, making arrangements to see your medical provider. If you or your child is exhibiting a fever of 100.4 or higher, experiencing cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing. If a student or member of our faculty is exhibiting two of these symptoms, they should stay home and see their provider for testing. Sore throat, runny nose, chills, loss of taste, muscle pain, nausea and vomiting, headache or diarrhea. You should test immediately from there. If a staff member or student who is tested and is positive for COVID-19 is determined, that person will be excluded from work or school for 14 calendar days after the positive testing date. This can be found in our PDE plan for health and safety that was approved by our school board on June 25th, 2020. Please keep in mind though, this is a fluid document and as new information is provided to us, we may adjust accordingly. All who are tested and are positive will be required to provide medical documentation of the positive test and clearance from a medical professional to return. Following as part of our required PDE health and safety plan approved by our school board on June 25th, 2020. Our return to work and school employees protocol, this is per CDC, is based on current available guidance about COVID-19 and is subject to change. Uh, the decision to discontinue isolation should be made in conjunction with an individual's personal physician and under the context of local circumstances. That means if you are available to have a test, community spread, underlying personal health issues, and so on. Clearance will, be need, to, will need to be submitted to the Southmoreland administration where you may return to work or school. For CDC guidelines, persons with laboratory confirmed COVID-19 who have symptoms and were directed to care for themselves at home may discontinue isolation under these conditions only. 14 days have passed since the first symptoms have appeared. At least 24 hours have passed since the recovery defined as resolution of fever without the use of fever reducing medications. Improvement in your respiratory symptoms, including shortness of breath and, and ending of cough. And in addition to the above guidelines, the individual must provide, provide written clearance from a medical provider. In short, if one is symptomatic, stay home, please test. If that test proves positive, whether you were symptomatic or asymptomatic, 14 calendar days quarantine, medical documentation of the positive test and clearance to return 
from the medical profession will be required for the return to school for students and staff. If negative and asymptomatic, clearance to return from the medical profession will be required for return for students and staff. Please note, for some of our families, vacation does not always happen just in the summer. If you and your family are traveling to one of the governor's hotspot areas, as he mentioned on July 2nd, quarantine for 14 days is required before a return to work or school. Those locations are Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Louisiana, Mississippi, Nevada, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Utah. This list is subject to change. Please be advised. What is the implication of a positive COVID case for others in the building? Guidance from the CDC regarding exposure to a positive case by other students and faculty is currently based upon the June 4th, 2020 recommendations. Please note that additional guidance is expected from CDC and may provide more definitive answers. A person who has COVID symptoms, that person should stay home for 14 days after last exposure and maintain social distance from others at all times. Uh, exposure means that individual has been in close contact with you six feet or under for more than 15 minutes. So whether a person is exhibiting symptoms or has tested positive, these standards apply. The person who is positive or showing symptoms must stay home for 14 calendar days. Based upon the current guidance, if students and teachers are exposed for more than 15 minutes and within six feet of a person who's showing symptoms of COVID-19 or is COVID-19 confirmed, the CDC recommends quarantine for all classroom and student teachers who may be exposed. However, with our social distancing protocols in place and limited numbers of students in common areas, we hope to avoid those situations. New guidance from CDC and the DOH pertaining to schools is expected in the next few weeks and this may further affect our protocols. It is important to note that these symptoms, including fever, have been the cause for sending students home for many years prior to COVID-19. This has been the protocol of our nurses for many years. What happens if there is a case? How do we notify people and also respect HIPAA? The Department of Health or County and Municipal Health Departments will notify the school entity immediately upon learning that a person is confirmed or has a probable case of COVID-19 and was present at the school or in a school event while infectious. They will assist the school with risk assessment, isolation, quarantine recommendations, and other inf infection control recommendations. Schools should take every measure to maintain the confidentiality of the affected individual. Please note, it is the responsibility of the Department of Health and the Municipal Health Department staff to contact a student or staff person with COVID-19 inform close context of their personal exposure or possible exposure and give instructions to those involved, including siblings and other household members regarding self quarantine and exclusions. The individual who tested positive will not be identified in communications from the Department of Health or Municipal Health Department to the school community at large, but may, may need to be selectively identified for contact tracing by the Department of Health and the Municipal Health Department staff. Pre-K schools are reminded to contact local Department of Health and Medi uh, Municipal Health Department staff before acting in response to a known or suspected communicable disease. If that person is present on school property, when the Department of Health or CMHT staff notify us of the positive case, that person will be immediately but discreetly taken to the COVID-related isolation space for pickup. In our buildings, we will have a sick and well area, well for treatment of kids, we have normal everyday needs in our sick area for uh, potential and suspected cases of COVID-19 and we'll ask to be uh, to go home. We will establish procedures for transporting home sick individuals if they do not have a way. We will contact the Department of Health or our local municipal health department for further guidance if a parent, guardian, or caregiver gives not notification to the school of potential exposure by a student, staff member, or school visitor. This does not mean the entire building must be evacuated. In short, in the event of a potential or confirmed case and exposure for students, faculty, and staff, all affected parties would be notified and directed regarding whether or not to begin distance learning effective for the following day. 
This message would, again, not include specific information regarding the individual, but would provide expectations for students, teachers, and families in response to this concern. It is expected that additional guidance regarding how schools will proceed safely and honor HIPAA requirements for protecting individual information is forthcoming. Another very common question that we receive from my task force is, are temperatures to be taken and who will do this? Parents, you should be taking your children's temperature every morning before school. Faculty and staff will do so also. If your child's temperature is 104 or higher, you should remain at home. Parents should consider testing immediately. Additionally, each school will have a temperature reader that we purchased using our CARES Act funding that will be located in the main entrances to scan for higher temperatures as students enter the building. No touch thermometers are also in every office and nurse's suites. Ms. Long uh, spoke on this earlier, but I would like to reiterate, will students be required to wear masks to and in school? This was one of our most frequently posed questions. Our understanding of the most recent guidance, released on the 16th, is that students will wear masks only in situations where social distancing of six or more feet is not possible. Again, you may remove your mask when eating and drinking, if spaced six feet apart or more, seated at desks or assigned workspaces at least six feet apart, engaged in activity that is six feet apart, face covering breaks and recess and so on, because only one half of each class will be meeting in person on a given day in the AB model, desks and spacing will permit students not to wear masks during instructional time. Another question that was posed to the health and safety group, how will nurses be able to work with possible COVID cases and also serve other students and faculty needs? It's a great question. As part of the task force's work, each nurse's suite will have a sick and well space that are separated to limit contact between these two groups. Dividers, air purifiers, and other support material has also been identified through CARES Act money for this issue. What will the district do to provide emotional and social support for students and teachers in the wake of this issue? The school district recognizes the effects of this pandemic on our students and staff. Resources, including materials recommended by our counselors, have been procured to enhance our emotional support system. This includes increased access to St. Vincent prevention programming, which will play a vital role in the integrating of students and staff back into school. The Health and Safety Task Force has been given some pretty difficult things. I hope that these answers, as we currently understand the guidance, provide you some clarification and also some comfort because these are difficult things for us to plan for and also difficult things for us to execute. But with all of the planning and work that we have done, we feel confident that our health and safety plan will be one that makes sure that kids are safe and enjoy school while they're with us on campus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clara. Next up is Mr. Alexander Novikov, Southmoreland School District Special Education Coordinator and SPC Assistant Principal and the Chairperson of our Instruction and Student Services Task Force. Mr. Novikov. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Haichu. Um, first, uh, I'd like to thank the committee members who have uh, so far been working with this task force. Uh, Mrs. Heather Myers, a middle school counselor. Mrs. Lisa Frado, elementary school counselor. Uh, Ms. Jamie Gore, a secondary music teacher and parent. Uh, Dr. Jason Boone, who's a parent and the curriculum supervisor for the Westmoreland Intermediate Unit. Uh, Mrs. DiBiazio, first grade teacher. Uh, Mrs. Jennifer Taraski is a seventh grade ELA teacher and Shannon Birch, a uh, speech and language uh, pathologist within our elementary school. Uh, so before I share my screen and jump in, we did try to consolidate these questions. Um, I know people may be sick of hearing it's a fluid process, but it is a fluid process. Um, we're gonna be asking teachers, administrators, and community members to do something that hasn't been done before. And that's kind of happening, happening nationally now. So what I'm gonna to do today is really try to tackle those knowns and that we can address within what an AB model looks like. I'll briefly review our, our cyber uh, or virtual platform models and, and answer some of the um, big underlying questions. A lot of this next couple weeks that we're getting into revolves around professional learning, uh, mapping out some curricular um, questions. So there are more answers that come as we keep um, uh, evolving in this process. So if I'm going to share my screen. 
So I have sort of a, a frequently asked questions list right here, jotting down the responses. Um, I'm trying not to read too much. I would like to be a little more uh, discussion based, but um, first, how do you sign my, how do I sign my child up for distance learning? If you're looking at a fully virtual Southmoreland option, uh, there is a Google form that we've created that we will be sharing. Only needs your response if you plan on utilizing virtual learning. Uh, expect that this week. You do not have to submit anything. Otherwise, we will then put that AB group as Ms. Tuhar laid out. You can identify a preference if you have one, um, but we kind of want to give some time to allow parents. We understand parents may choose later to make that choice, so there is some fluidity to that as, as uh, people's lives change or different things happen. Uh, can they change that enrollment once the school year started? Yes. Uh, that's the plan as of it sits today. We are trying to make sure that we can accommodate students who may have, uh, there may have been some concerns that want to start purely virtual and they want to come back to our schools. Uh, we are going to be allowing that opportunity for families. What are those fully online options? So students in kindergarten through fifth grade, because of utilizing an AB model and splitting those days in students, we are able to take a homeroom teacher and dedicate them solely to just teaching that grade level's virtual component. So if you are an incoming second grader and would like your child to be fully virtual, um, there will be a Southmoreland teacher teaching second grade. Uh, those will encompass some synchronous lessons, meaning some live type Zoom, Google Meets lessons, as well as, as, well as virtual assignments. That is the K-5 um, option. For those students in the middle and high school, uh, we have the Southmoreland Online Academy uh, that we've used for in previous years, but we are encouraging families to then enroll in that process. Um, but as you declare what through the Google form what your choice is, then the more information about how that next step looks. So a big question, and I consolidated this to, to one summary, and I, I tried to write briefly, but I will I'll speak to it um, because a, a recurring theme is, how will distance learning be improved from last spring? Uh, it was kind of a recurring theme in many questions. So uh, first off, we, we've afforded um, all of our teachers the opportunity to complete Google um, Level 1 education certification. Uh, so far to this point, we have over 90 teachers, greater than 75% of our teaching staff has volunteered to do that training. Uh, the district is providing time and the, um, affording the actual off hours, summer hours for teachers to kind of build that capacity to uh, broaden their skills. So that's greater than 75% of our teaching staff. Uh, the board has also amended the district calendar to provide two additional in service days to the beginning of the year. So instead of two, they will have four uh, to allow for additional time to prepare. Uh, these four days will be used to participate in professional learning, focus on utilizing virtual platforms, instructional framework, uh, and then any curriculum modifications, um, and of course, time to prepare content. And they actually have five full days because one is a clerical day that is just for teachers, but the other four uh, will be scheduled professional learning. Um, this, the expectations that we're building as a committee or as a task force um, are, are really aimed to provide greater continuity. We know what happened in March. We weren't prepared. We were thrown into virtual at first two weeks, then multiple months, um, trying to, to do the best we could in that situation. Now trying to build some continuity across different grade levels with platforms, not going to multiple Google Classrooms, but having one homeroom for our students who are in the elementary grades, for teachers to start using familiar tools, less third-party resources and built. Um, but of course, we have to provide that training. We have exceptional teachers. It's just a matter of making sure we provide that training. So why an alternating six-day cycle over one of those two-on-two -two models that uh, Mr. Haichu described. I, I think the health, safety, logistics, they've described, Mr. Haichu described why we're going to a, a blended model, but out of the blended models, this, um, they're about 30% for those different models. Some will, some will week on, week off. Uh, some models have two, one, two, meaning my, my student would go Monday, Tuesday, everyone's off Wednesday, then Thursday, Friday, another student. A couple things. One, a lot of those models, all of them, you're either not seeing students for five to nine days without any face-to-face -face teacher instruction. Um, you know, we believe that so much time away from instructional staff mitigate the impact of instruction. We believe our teachers are our best resources. 
we want students to see our teachers and be near our teachers. Um, also, from a health standpoint, I know we had some concern about um, vacations and, and students traveling as well over those extended break times too. It's not really in my purview as far as our committee, but that was another concern. Um, another issue, especially with elementary, system, um, systematic intervention. We know students miss a lot of uh, content not being with their teachers in the spring. Uh, we've invested a lot of money in intervention systems in earlier grades. While we would love every single day, um, every other day still offers some fidelity of that process, especially for our earliest students who really um, need those foundational skills and, and have lost some time. And of course, that's all students, but that was another uh, factor. So uh, inequity was another issue. Um, if my child is on A, B um, schedule, I'm sorry, on a 212 schedule and I'm on Monday, Tuesday, we know that Labor Day and Columbus Day within the first nine weeks, they will not um, have instruction on those days and that they'll miss some of their face-to-face -face days. And if you really look at what a quarter looks like, that's upwards of 10% of all available face-to-face -face days. Uh, so there was kind of an equity issue. Um, for students while you were um, considering, while we were considering those models. And then finally, um, teachers across the country are being tasked with, with some pretty in, in incredible expectations. And a lot of districts in these models that we're familiar with are asking teachers to simultaneously teach kids every day and then assign five to nine, you know, however many days of classwork, um, three days at a time or five days at a time while they're not with their students to be done remotely. Um, you know, we didn't feel that was really reasonable, especially when it comes to feedback. Formative assessment and feedback is one of the most essential elements of education. And if our teachers are going three instructional days just assigning online content and not actually uh, asking the question, seeing our students, engaging our students, um, and of course they'd be teaching so they couldn't even do it virtually, they wouldn't have the time. What we did feel was that we could uh, create systems uh, where they're assigning one day's worth of work that can be done independently to reinforce or preview and then have that alternate day to really dig into that content and we'll explain that a, a little bit more. So that course led to how do you provide a full curriculum with one half of the school days being in person and these are very tough questions. We are doing something that has not been done. Um, there is not a, a mountain of research to say, well, you follow this script. So what we are looking at is one, enhancing our Google Classroom capacity so that students have continuity with when they're in and when they're out, sharing content that aligns with state standards and curriculum pacing. So we've already begun working and I know that we've had some great committee members develop. Well, if I looked at a six day cycle and I looked at what my students learning target was and I were to separate what absolutely requires a teacher and what can be done independently, whether it's pre-reading, whether it's practicing some of the road skills, whether it's watching a lecture, that we can assign one for home and really embrace one when the students are with us. And by that logic as well, class sizes are going to be anywhere from 10 to 15 students. So our teachers, when they have those numbers, are going to be able to have additional time to, to have those um, in-depth discussions, that questions and response to conduct the formative assessment. So we are not looking to half the curriculum, we are looking at changing pacing, but not half of the curriculum. Um, activities that can be completed without teacher assistance, uh, such as pre-reading, watching instructional video demonstration, practice rote repetitive skills, responding to writing prompts. Um, on in-person instructional days though, that's again where you dive deeper. I'm sorry to repeat myself there, reading the form. Uh, provisions made for students with special needs. Uh, students who receive special education services will have the opportunity to, opportunity to attend school for all five days. Um, it's an IEP team decision as we get closer to August. We, we're going to be reaching out to parents and discussing that. Um, we know that students with, there are students with special needs that um, services cannot be provided off days in this manner and that uh, especially uh, that's going to be afforded to them. Students who have IEPs who are going to be home though because of safety concerns for families, we still have um, related service providers, your speech and language pathologist, OTPT, and of course our IP case managers that will be able to provide support virtually. And what's important to emphasize in a lot of the other hybrid models um, or a lot of the whole return models, 
uh, teachers are stealing some of those resources to, to eliminate, to, to mitigate, to shrink class sizes and kind of, I think, harming special ed services. We still have our full special education team that is going to manage caseloads of appropriate numbers and provide um, exceptional service as they um, have done since, since I've been here and, and I'm sure years prior. And I know particularly during um, the spring shutdown, um, a lot of our special education staff uh, became very, very comfortable with conducting Zoom lessons, with recording um, uh, video uh, instructional um, lessons, with different models to reach out and connect to our kids. Uh, so that'll still be there whether you're within or if you decide to stay virtually. Uh, does SOLA provide a synchronous instruction teacher? Um, no, it, it, it does not. Students who are enrolled in SOLA participate um, in primarily asynchronous instruction. Um, the teacher, there is a teacher um, in the county who's assigned and who's responsible for communicating, grading, providing support to that roster. That of course leads to the next question is, why should I choose SOLA over another cyber program? So SOLA courses have been created by highly qualified instructors who are available to support your child during the school year. Yes, it's not a synchronous lesson, but they do respond, support, grade, and provide that teaching option. Um, many lessons uh, are recorded and um, students can access them anytime. Charter cyber schools, um, the misconception, I guess to speak frank, is the misconception is that, well, cybers have done this for years, so why aren't we looking at those? Um, but the fact of the matter is statistically, they do not perform um, very well whatsoever. We know as building level administrators, students who go to cyber routinely come back because of uh, the difficulties of that platform. The, the teachers are also, um, traditionally and generally not nearly as qualified or as experienced. The lessons are developed by county teachers through the IU through our local public schools. Um, to speak frank and directly to the community, every time I've been on a hiring committee as an administrator, I am flooded with cyber school teacher applicants. Um, the PA public schools hire the best because we have the best resources to offer. We have the best teachers. So the teachers developing your solar programs and your lessons are highly qualified teachers who have done it for years and years and years. There is no special cyber certification that these cyber schools are offering. It is generally somebody who's, I'm sure, an exceptional person who's just getting a job out of school. And, and I'm sure there's great experiences and there's not so great experiences, but I think that there's a general misconception that there's a certain cyber certification and that is not the case whatsoever. And furthermore, um, I am overwhelmingly confident in telling you that our teachers in throughout the county those teachers developing these courses have far more experience um, delivering this content and hitting these standards. So what is flip learning? Flip learning has come up a lot and probably to my fault, I think I've referenced it a few times. So let me, let me dive in here to discuss that because there's multiple questions about flip learning and, and this question doesn't have a question mark, so I apologize. Um, flip learning is an instructional approach that asks students to complete independent activities where the teacher is not needed to be present. So recording lectures, pre-reading of text, uh, therefore freeing up more time for more meaningful instruction. Theory is that by flipping the classroom, teachers can spend more time digging deeper into the content when working with students. Now, South Moreland is not becoming a flip learning school. That is not a silver bullet that we are saying that now we're just gonna flip everything and, and everything's solved. However, we recognize as educational professionals that there is a lot of great ideas in that framework, um, which does have a large amount of research, which has been done in different um, schools and even universities. So we felt it was really important to tap into some of those resources. Um, we actually are scheduled with uh, some professional development for our teachers uh, with a nationally recognized ASCD, that's the Association for Supervision Curriculum Development, published author. Um, so we're bringing in absolutely one of uh, the best in the country to help our teachers really start to think about what can be done at home to a decent, reasonable degree and what absolutely should be invested in here in school. So one of the, I think, misconceptions was that that was just going to be the magic, you know, bullet, so to speak. It's not, but it is a framework and a known framework that we can grow professionally and invest in and as for years to come, I think, can benefit us once we do, and we will return to normal. How will K-5 children uh, have special classes, art, gym, STEM, music, computer, library, on a six-day cycle? Because right now, they are, of course, on a six-day cycle. So some of this stuff is still being worked out as a committee. So, uh, so please, I know that, um, that uh, 
this may not completely answer for you, but essentially um, they'll stay on that six day cycle, but only on the in-person days. So I know it's more like a 12 day, right? So if I come Monday, I have art. If I come Wednesday, I have gym. Um, as far as what those off days look like, whether we compound them is another consideration. So if Mr. Boring had you for gym on Wednesday, on Thursday, your task when you go home may be to complete um, so many of those challenges, the stair challenge that I know that he was doing um, in the spring in the last quarter, so that there's a connection with those two. So your student will still be having all six of our specials. Um, I know at the secondary level, they are either grouped in quarters or in semesters, so they will have those on the AB schedule. And we are taking every provision to ensure that some of those unique specials like music and, and art that in gym, we know so many of our kids come to school for those classes. So really making sure that, that we're still doing them, that we are still finding a way to be creative and unique and employing those specialists um, is really important to us. And it's one of the big, um, I think sales sales of coming on that AB schedule. You still are going to have that special without going long periods of time without it. How will we contact teachers on remote learning days? Well, essentially, that's not going to be really part of the plan. On distance learning days, teachers are going to be providing assignments that are designed to be completed independently. So the decisions are going to be made at the professional discretion of the teacher who's going to prioritize assigning tasks that can be completed completely independently. The idea, of course, is that you're not going to have to get a lot of feedback. The feedback comes when you're with the teacher. So is it a preview or a review? It's going to be a lot of the teacher's pacing and discretion. Um, but that was, again, a big reason why you do every other day. So that next day I see the teacher, I'm not going multiple days. Um, a question was, will teachers provide assignments prior to the start of the school year? No, that is not going to be an expectation. I mean, such a short, quick answer there. But it was a, a legitimate question was, well, if I'm going to be half, can we start now? Um, no, that's, that's not the model. Our model is to develop a pacing that still um, is respective of the actual curriculum. Uh, will my, only my child's teacher be posting virtual assignments? Uh, yes. I know that was something where we had teachers share responsibility and we, we our PLC, you know, schools that believe in teaming and in the work of teams. So teachers will still assist each other, um, but we're not going to be asking students to bounce between teachers as much. And that's something from a functionality standpoint of Google that we're working on so that if I go, if I'm a, a child, especially a younger child, a first grade student, I'm just going to my students, my teacher's homeroom and all of my tasks are there, not having to go between older students. It depends on who's teaching the course. If they have um, a certain history teacher, they go to that and then another. So that's a lot of cleaning up some functionality issues. Uh, will explicit guidelines, uh, what explicit guidelines is administration giving teachers regarding the virtual content? Again, we're in the very early stages of this. I know that six weeks is not a lot of time, but we are working, we're meeting weekly. But really what we are looking at, um, looking at PLC teams to map out learning targets over a period of days. I was just working with um, a teacher on the task force who sent an incredible example I can't wait to share. I just didn't want to kind of put on the spot. Now I wanted to work through it with her of what a six day unit or module would look like. This is the learning target. Let's break down this standard on our pacing guide, look at the learning targets and look at the elements of what students need to be able to do. What has to happen with a teacher and what can be practiced and done at home. So um, we have some models we're looking and working through that are actual like lesson plan type models. So you're planning out modules or units. Um, that's in the process. Again, I'm very excited about some of the work that's going on and we will share. I'm sure we'll have another community forum. I'll be able to share an actual copy of what that looks like. Um, but it is being developed so that teachers know they have to still get through that pacing and that curriculum. Uh, so this is a question that um, came up. Other districts are doing this. So of course it comes up, right? Is it possible to live stream teacher lessons to students who are at home and participating in the AB model, not fully virtual? So this has come up because other districts have said that they would essentially set up a Zoom camera and teach students. And if the student was at home, then they would get the lesson. And if students were there, they would get the lesson. So it's not a consideration aside from we do have some technological limitations that we didn't really uh, invest in. I know that one district has a robot and other ones have some special hearing um, options or AirPods to use. 
But we also believe that running those live lessons limits the efficacy of instruction. If I'm not there in class to, to be part of the questions and answers and discussion and be in the authentic learning environment, that teacher is presenting something that those students get a different quality than the ones at home. And just flipping them, while it sounds like it makes sense, I think it undermines the actual impact of having a teacher side by side in that space, um, practicing their craft. Uh, so just to say, we'll just, slap a camera up, um, we did not believe that that was a reasonable option. And again, we're all kind of doing this new across the country. So I don't def definitely don't want to disparage another district who believed that. That was not what we felt uh, would work um, the, the best. However, K-5 students who are participating fully online will have synchronous lessons. Um, those teachers will teach in synchronous lessons, but they won't have other students. So they will be getting the full attention of those students who are online. Um, the model that was sometimes suggested of recording would be that, or, or videotaping would be that I have my 10 here and 10 are watching me online. And we know that a teacher cannot uh, service both equitably. Uh, when will teachers plan for online learning days as well as in-person days? So the AB models attended to be continuous pacing that addresses learning targets aligned with the standards. Teachers will utilize those teaming times and the regular scheduled prep periods to develop and address those standards. So everything will be facilitated through Google Classroom and embedded in there. Uh, it should not be dramatically different from planning required for, for traditionally fully in-person instruction. We have standards. We have to address the learning targets. We have to set assessment uh, measurements that we have the assessments. Um, it's going to be different as far as how it looks, but the process of teaching, of, of looking at a standard and, and breaking that standard down, identifying learning targets and the modes in which we reach those and, and, and uh, assess student mastery really should not look dramatically different. And having that every other day should provide for a great assessment time. Uh, update solo information came up multiple times. So that's heard, noted, we will. There's some flyers, some resources, and some data uh, that, that we're gonna be able to share and post. I know that uh, we had several responses and questions um, that, that wanted some updated information regarding that. Uh, what other platforms have you looked at aside from Google Classroom? We really haven't because we firmly believe um, as we're purchasing Chromebooks, as We've utilized Google for years. Um, we believe we just need to be better with this platform. It meets our needs. It's just growing our capacity. And over, like I said, 75% so far, and that's, that's just right now, teachers have already um, signed up to use their time in the summer to become certified, and we'll make sure the remaining 25% do as well. Um, have you discussed having in-person instruction each day in secondary completing work virtually? Um, first off, it's just something that, that we just mathematically can manage. That has come up multiple times. Um, we do not have enough elementary certified teachers to do that. And again, there's another equity, equity issue. You know, is that really for just because secondary is slightly more, is, is more capable to use a computer, doesn't mean they don't benefit from in-person instruction. Um, so even if we had the teachers, which we don't to do, we don't have the staffing numbers. Um, when I say that, I mean certified elementary teachers. Um, it's still something that, that necessarily we don't believe is an equitable way to uh, service our students. How will virtual grading systems be handled? This came up a lot in the spring. I know there's a lot of pass fail. No, there will be grades as traditionally grades have always been. Uh, students from grades K-5 will have an assigned teacher who's responsible for virtual instruction. Those are for those fully cyber students. Um, of course, if you're doing AB, the teacher is going to grade you on some more traditional assessments when you're in class. Uh, this teacher will provide feedback through the Google Classroom and parent contact. Uh, students will be graded based on an assigned task and sequence learning targets with grades updated and maintained in CSIU. If you're K through five doing virtual or, or, or solo at secondary, you're still a, a student in our district. Um, solo students have assigned teachers for each course um, and it, it, they, that, that teacher is responsible as far as grading and, and tracking that progress within that course. And we do have a uh, solo liaison as well within our district to, to ensure that as well. What about students who mastered learning targets came up, whether it's gifted or just advanced students? So embracing the professional learning community model, the PLC model, you know, we know teachers, that we as a team and administrators should be able to address the four essential questions. You know, what do we want students to know? How will we know they know it? And what do we do for those students who have not mastered it? 
and what do we do to those students who have mastered it? Sorry. Uh, following those essential questions, we're going to continue developing those plans. I know the feeling was if it's just like the spring, we're not that comfortable, but this is not. This is meant to be um, a continuation of curriculum. So if teachers are assigning independent lessons and in-person lessons, if students are demonstrating mastery of content, then enriching that or extending it is part of the process. And our teachers have done that for, for years. That, that's, that is their, their expertise. Uh, and then what training will students and families receive for uh, accessing virtual content? So significant focus at the start of the year, especially in early elementary or those days students are coming in is how do these functions work? What is my login? How do I access the website? Where is my homeroom? Um, and then we also have compiled in this, I know we started in the spring, but we're really vetting um, and creating resources to share so parents can have that information as well and have that access to be able to, this is how I access this content online. And last, uh, this was a question, how do you provide intervention? Uh, we do have some products, 95% group, uh, Read Naturally, uh, Sunday is not on there. Some different companies that we provide some reading intervention materials to that have virtual products. I imagine that list is going to grow. So the idea is that on in-person days, those interventions will continue as they were. They may look different with a teacher coming in than a student coming out like we did in one time. But even on off days, there are lessons that, are, that can be um, assigned and completed. And we still have our specialists in the primary center and in the elementary school to really support those struggling um, uh, students. And I know more questions are going to come up. I have an instructional fact sheet as well. Um, not as many as Ms. Kuhar, but I have an instructional fact sheet as well. And uh, we'll post, but there's gonna be plenty of updates. Um, I, I definitely look forward to, to go continuing this process. Please don't hesitate to, to call or email or reach out to me directly um, as a lot of this is gonna unfold in the coming days and more information will be shared. So uh, with that, I think I've been long enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Haichu. And thank you, Mr. Novikoff. Next up is Mr. Daniel Krofchak, South Moreland High School principal and the chairperson of our Staffing and Resources Task Force. Mr. Krofchak. Thank you, Mr. Haichu. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank um, all, all the individuals in, up here and in the community that, that have really um, starting to lay the foundation as, as we uh, embark upon this upcoming school year a lot of hard work and I echo the sentiments that every single person on here has uh, has conveyed so far. Uh, a lot of staffing and resources, um, it does not stand independent. So I, I don't have a great depth of information um, specific to that. We have sifted through and a lot of the staffing and resources issues ha have kind of filtered themselves through the other uh, task force uh, because we have resources um, that we have to concern ourselves at every level with sanitation, uh, with education, um, with materials uh, that will be necessary um, to, to put our program together moving forward. So I will hit upon a couple uh, of the key resource issues. Um, that kind of stood out beyond uh, what was already discussed pretty in depth um, across the other task force. Um, one of the most common questions that we did see um, come across the email list uh, pertain to the availability of and the, I guess, setup for the, the Chromebook program uh, as we come upon, uh, come upon the close of the school year or of the summer in, in opening of the school year. Um, Chromebooks and internet access, the two most um, prevalent themes that came out of a lot of the emails. Um, at a, a board meeting earlier here um, in the summer, the school board did uh, direct the administration to order 1,900 Chromebooks. And uh, we have placed the order for 1,900 Chromebooks. And to speak on that, uh, there are a lot of questions on, on shipment dates and arrivals. 
Um, currently, the superintendent and solicitor uh, are working together with Dell, as well as other, uh, other third party vendors uh, in an effort to expedite the shipment process. Uh, so subsequently, we don't have a firm date uh, the, the date of receipt is pending uh, as they're going through those talks to try to move as quickly as possible to get those items. What we have also um, in, in terms of the materials or resources or, or computer materials that, that are necessary, we've had a lot of questions about um, internet access and we will, as we did at the close of last school year, we will continue to have building level Wi-Fi locations, um, but we will also like to add that we are going to survey again the district because uh, we have new families moving in through kindergarten, many families exiting through the uh, graduation. Um, what we want to determine is what is the, the need for internet services and then we will work accordingly uh, with those families. We have um, budgeted through PCCD grant money, um, monies to uh, specifically purchase mobile hotspots um, that we uh, can work with families in using and setting up based on need and necessity. Um, how we, we can address those will be very specific to each family uh, that is in an internet um, or, or needs internet because you're looking at different service areas. Um, we had discussed uh, prior to, to this, uh, this forum here, um, there are some areas of this district that are Comcast, there are some that are Armstrong. So we have to work specifically with those families uh, to, to try to really hone in on how we can accommodate that. Uh, we're also, and we also have information in uh, Ms. Kuhar uh, last year provided a lot of great information on services that are available, um, internet essentials through Comcast, uh, Verizon plans that, that will work to afford, um, uh, to get families that are in need to afford these services uh, at a much lower rate. Um, we say all of this and we have invested in the, the Chromebooks as part of our educational plan. I want to reiterate and, and really affirm here that we are not going to issue packets uh, as we have in the past. We, we will not be issuing um, packets uh, specifically uh, we are, are seeking to be uh, completely um, computer accessed only at this point uh, as we move forward. So we'll be looking for um, next week a, a, an additional survey that comes out. We will also have a phone number for individuals to contact. Um, obviously, if there's not the ability to access the internet, um, they will need to call uh, or stop in to, to the uh, district, uh, any of the district buildings open from 8 to 3 um, and let us know information uh, regarding your internet ac accessibility. So this this will be more geared, the survey geared more to, to getting updated data on those that need assistance or need internet accessibility uh, moving forward. That is the largest resource that I think um, that we are uh, really um, in need to, to uh, move forward with our overall program, our AB and distance learning programs. Uh, so I thought I would take an opportunity also, uh, being the, the principal of, of Southmoreland High School, there are a number of unique high school issues uh, because we have so many different uh, areas, uh, including athletics and marching band, uh, as well as uh, CTC, uh, to address some of these things, uh, as well as uh, other student services, uh, like driving, like work permits, like all of those things. So in looking through a lot of the questions, I hope I can clear up some things here uh, with the information I'm going to present. 
A uh, one common question is, can my child still attend CTC if they have gone or exercised the um, signing up for SOLA? And, and the answer is yes. Um, we we currently, um, prior to the to the March 13th shutdown, have worked with students that have been SOLA students that have gone to CTC. Uh, we will continue to move forward in the same way uh, with that. Uh, allowing for SOLA and CTC uh, to exist or coexist. Now, there will need to be some things worked out individually from students regarding uh, transportation uh, because of scheduling. If you're going completely or fully virtual um, in, in entering SOLA, there will be some transportation things that we will have to work out uh, to call the office here, call the guidance office here, and uh, we will work those things out. Uh, the second question is, how will CTC look? Um, as we sit right now, and I have spoken uh, with Mr. Caveron, the principal of CTC, and we have worked with, with them over time as we always do. Um, there are nine member districts that are going to CTC, and there are nine different plans for opening the school year they are going to accommodate whatever plan the school sending school is using moving forward and that is if it's an AB model it'll be very similar uh, there as well in which students will go on A will be remote on B and that will also include the tech courses and that is where we stand right now. Um, if those things do change or programming does change or there are other options or opportunities, we will bring this forth. But as, as we are, that is what they're operating. They're kind of working with the nine member schools uh, to do what they feel is necessary uh, to accommodate each school. Uh, we are meeting next week, the nine member schools um, and the, the tech administration uh, to, to put things out and to kind of um, uh, get a, a final push on ideas uh, as to how things will look. Uh, and we will continue to put out information uh, accordingly um, uh, to the community, to the students and families as we get it. That was a very large question that we did see numerous times. Um, also, are we continuing with extracurricular activities? Uh, yes, we do have an a, a, a athletic plan uh, that has been executed and put into effect in school in, in teams are already working through conditioning and other other uh, activities spelled out by the athletic plan. The marching band has a, a, a specific plan, board approved plan that they're also following and the guidelines uh, that they are using um, to move forward. So nothing uh, has changed regarding those activities. As of Wednesday, the PIAA, this is last Wednesday, met and, and still are continuing with activities. Again, this is just the, the, the same theme over and over. Everything's fluid and everything is continuing to change. Um, we will uh, update uh, as new items come forward. Um, any activities we will continue if we, we can fall within the guidelines. We have plans for in terms of high school activities continuing to, to move forward with. Um, one, one common question as well is um, regarding student driving. Um, we, we, again, encourage uh, in, in this unique time, we are going to encourage student driving. Um, Mrs. Uh, Sutton, Mrs. Raquel Sutton here is on the call with us as well. We work to, um, consistently through a lot of high school issues as she's uh, over, over the past couple of months. Um, Mrs. Sutton, if you want to remind some things and not change regarding drivings, what are some of the fundamental rules in terms of, even though we're encouraging driving, um, what are some of the fundamental things that we have to address over and over again throughout the year of high school? Yes, we are encouraging students to drive if they are able. Um, it would still be household members riding together. So it's a sibling or somebody that resides in your household. 
you are able to obtain a driving permit from the main office um, anytime they're open. You need your license, proof of insurance, and registration. And there is a $15 fee. Um, we have cut that down from past years. We do have plenty of spaces, and even with the AB schedule, we should have plenty of room for as many students that are able to drive to drive, and that would also alleviate some of the students riding on our bus transportation. We, we are, I'm gonna have a conversation with um, the superintendent as well as, as the Board of Education in this unique time to consider the potential for sophomores that are licensed, obviously, uh, to drive uh, to school that is currently not in um, the driving policy, but I believe if we can encourage driving at the high school level, it kind of alleviates um, it doesn't completely eliminate transportation issues, but alleviates a little bit on, on the transportation end uh, to make things easier on the upfront uh, and to um, get students here uh, perhaps in a less um, socially, well, we, when you have less students on the bus or on the high school run. But if we can do that, we want to make sure we do follow within the safely, uh, safety and guidelines that uh, we always do, which is still the one thing I don't see changing at this point is um, riding passengers uh, that are not uh, members of the household. So let's, let's keep those things in mind uh, as we really start to see driving applications uh, coming forward. Those, those are the, the, the main issues uh, in, in resources and unique high school issues at this point. Uh, that we have to address. And as always, you know, I, I encourage um, anyone to reach out to any of us uh, on this panel up here. Uh, we, we have um, our, our email addresses are all easy to remember. Uh, our last name, first initial, or first name, um, they're all on the southmoreland.net website. Uh, our phone numbers all listed, all information listed there. Please don't hesitate to, to reach out if you have questions uh, about anything as we kind of navigate through the, the beginning of this school year. So with that, Mr. Haichu, um, thank you for um, really uh, hosting this and putting a lot of this together. Thank you, Mr. Krofchak, and thank you, Mrs. Sutton. In closing, I hope that our conversation provides you the clarity you need and deserve in moving forward in your decision-making processes for your children. We look forward to the opportunity and welcome the opportunity to continue our service on their behalf. And we genuinely hope that we have earned your confidence in our ability to successfully navigate these times and educate your children in the promotion and advancement of their academic and personal development. I do want to emphasize, I do want to emphasize, you have this team's commitment and our teachers' commitment that we will do better with our online and virtual platforms. We are putting in place the necessary professional development and training. And we also are going to do a great job on those instructional days with the approach of targeted learning learning targets on the six-day cycle. This is perhaps a move toward the future in education, and we embrace the challenge and know that you have our commitment, our, our dedication, and our support. And I do want to echo the sentiments of the others already uh, who said it. Please do not hesitate to call out or reach out to us individually with specific questions that you may have or that may have been generated from our conversations today, or if there were items that we were not able to address in the time frame uh, and, and the emphasis of today's conversations. Um, in closing, I would like to say uh, to all of our students, guys, we miss you, and to uh, families and, and teachers alike, make it a great day, guys. <laughs>